All right. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Lily Mulway, and welcome to the first episode of Through the Parks. We will be covering um, Yellowstone National Park, which is the technically the first ever national park, or some people argue that it's the first, um, like, real national park. Uh, anyways, I'm just going to cover some stuff. Uh, this is obviously my first time ever doing this, so it might not be that good, but I hope you guys do enjoy. Uh, I very much love national parks. They're so beautiful, and someday I wish to visit all of them, but as of right now, I don't have the means to go to any national parks, so I haven't uh, 100% like completed that goal, but I do hope to one day uh, visit all of them, hopefully. But yeah, so the first couple of episodes of this podcast are going to be covering um, all the national parks history and like information about the parks. And then after th we cover those, uh, we can like dive into more of like uh, specific things that happen in parks and like events, uh, like Fat Bear Week and other stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so I'm gonna get started with like kind of the overall info that I collected. I did a lot of research for this and um, I got like 13 pages of things you have to cover. <laughs> so uh, but yeah, I'll try my best to uh, go through it a little bit fast, but not too fast. Get you guys situated. We don't want to be here forever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so Yellowstone is a national park and it is located in the western United States, mostly located in uh, like the northwest corner of Wyoming, but it does spread into like Montana and Idaho, but like it gets like, it's mainly in Wyoming. So usually if you're, you're in the park, you're in Wyoming or Montana and then maybe a little bit of Idaho, but it's definitely focused in Wyoming. Uh, it was established, so this national park was established uh, with the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act, and it was signed uh, into law by President Grant on March 1st, 1872, and that's when it officially became a national park, uh, 1872. <laughs> so Yellowstone is the first national park in the United States, uh, but some people do believe that it is the first national park in the world. I can't... Like, uh, I can't 100% verify that, but some people do believe that it's the first national park in the world. So this park is known for a lot of different things. Uh, they're known for their, like, large collections of wildlife, uh, biomes, and geothermal features. So, like, your geysers and volcanoes and that kind of stuff. Um, the most popular of those features, of the geothermal features, is the Old Faithful Geyser. Geyser? I believe I'm saying that right. I don't know why it sounds wrong all of a sudden. Uh, but yeah, that is the most popular of the features. Uh, but yeah, another thing about these geysers that we'll get into is uh, safety around them. I'll focus more into that when we get towards the uh, geothermal aspect of the national park, but there's definitely a lot of safety uh, stuff that you have to know before you go into this park, just to stay safe. That it's a lot of na uh, national parks have safeties and a lot of them give out pamphlets before you go into the park that tell you how to stay safe and what to look out for. Um, so while Yellowstone has a ton of biomes, the main one is your subalpine forest. This just means that the biome and wildlife is situated on like higher slopes. So like mountains, that kind of stuff, or uh, just below like a timber line. So Yellowstone is considered a part of the South Central Rockies. Uh, but yeah, that means that it is a temperate, conferious forest uh, of ecoregion of the United States, and it's also considered drier than the North Central Rockies. Uh, but yeah, so Native Americans lived in the Yellowstone region for at least 11,000 years and had some visits from mountain men, which are uh, like men who explored the wild and made a living off of like hunting and fishing. During the early to mid 19th century, however, organized exploration didn't start until like the 1860s. So it didn't start until like a while after that. Um, but yeah, so initially before being given to the Park Service, the National Park Service, Yellowstone was under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Department of the Interior. And the first ever secretary to supervise the park was Columbus Delano. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, but yeah. 
Eventually, though, the United States Army uh, was commissioned to oversee the management of Yellowstone between the years of 1886 and 1916. And that's roughly like, that's like 30 years of management. So they were there for a while uh, and they kind of took care of the park during that time. Um, but in 1917, the park was transferred to the group we know and love today, uh, the National Park Service, uh, which had just been created the previous year. The National Park Service wasn't created until like 1916, and so they took over the park uh, just a year later. But yeah, so that's, that's some fun information. Um, there are hundreds of different structures that have been built on Yellowstone and are officially protected uh, because of their historical significance. Uh, but yeah, and there are like thousands of archaeological sites. Yellowstone is huge, and so uh, having these structures and stuff like that is not a complete surprise, but they do have many, and if I were to cover all of them, we would be here way longer than it's already going to take. So that's kind of uh, like the overall info that you'd have to know about these parks, and exactly kind of just a little bit overall before we start diving into like the more specifics, but... Yeah, so now we're going to get into the ecological info, which is like your uh, environments, that kind of stuff. Ecology, I believe that's, yeah, ecology is, I believe, environments, land, ecosystems, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so environments, you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, so the Yellowstone National Park uh, spans 3,468 square miles and contains lakes, canyons, rivers, and mountain ranges. Uh, Yellowstone's Lake is one of the largest high elevation lakes in all of North America, and it is centered over the Yellowstone supervolcano. If you didn't know, Yellowstone is uh, technically a volcano. It's hard to kind of describe. We'll get into it, but it's technically a volcano. But Yellowstone supervolcano is considered to be dormant, which means it is not active, and we really shouldn't have to worry about it erupting. Uh, but it has erupted several times in the past, like two million years so we really don't have to worry about it but it is considered dormant but it is still technically an active volcano and does have a chance of erupting but definitely not something that we have to worry about uh, but yeah half of the world's geysers and hyd hydrothermal features are located in Yellowstone uh, and is fueled by the volcano that we were just talking about so due to the volcano uh, lava flows uh, and rocks from its eruptions it covers most of the land in Yellowstone. So when the volcano erupted, the lava kind of, you know, went down into the park and then rocks also fell into the park. And that makes up most of what is Yellowstone. Um, but yeah, so Yellowstone is the centerpiece of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So it is the main area when you mention that is kind of what you think of. Uh, and it is one of the largest remaining nearly intact ecosystems in Earth's northern zone, meaning that we haven't destroyed it yet. Huzzah! <laughs> it's still standing, uh, nearly intact. We have done some damage to it, but it's still still thriving as of right now. Uh, but in 1978, Yellowstone was turned into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and yeah. Hundreds of different creatures, including mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians, and several endangered and threatened creatures have been documented in the park. Uh, we'll get into those along with uh, several unique species of plants. Those will be in our biology section, which we will be covering. But yeah, that's just kind of in general that there have been hundreds of different creatures documented in the park. Um, Yellowstone is the largest and most famous megafauna uh, that just means, like, uh, large animals, so you're, like, your bison, your elks, that kind of stuff, um, but it's, uh, located in the United States. That's not including, uh, Hawaii and Alaska, so when I said, when, like, when I mentioned, like, in the United States, I'm talking about, like, in the connected area, so, like, our 48 states that are all connected, it, that's the largest and most famous megafauna is Yellowstone in that area, not talking about uh, Alaska or Hawaii, which I think Alaska is fucking huge, so they might beat them on that one, but I'll have to see. <laughs> Some of their well-known large animals include their grizzly bears, cougars, wolves, and free-ranging herds of bison and elk. Uh, speaking of the Yellowstone bison herd, that one is the oldest and largest 
uh, public bison herd in the United States. So yeah, it is the oldest, I believe. I did not know it was the largest, though. That is wild. I wouldn't be surprised, though. Yellowstone is like, you know, it's, like, giant. You know, nobody really messes with it. There's no one really trying to kill these bison, so... Of course, it would kind of become the largest. Uh, but forest fires occur in the park every year, which is normal. So if you don't know, fires naturally occur, uh, like occur, I can speak, naturally occur <laughs> in the wild. And so it's not deadly or dangerous really to have forest fires. But yeah, so they occur in the park every year. And the largest forest fire, this one was a dangerous one, was in 1988 which burned nearly one-third of the park. Now, I do plan on covering uh, the 1988 National, you know, Yellowstone National Park fire later on. I don't want to cover it in this one because we'll be here for <laughs> even longer, um, but it it's definitely one I do want to cover because it is a wild one because there's kind of some ma mistakes made. Not, not It's kind of hard. You can't really blame them because fires are hard to predict, it seems more like an accident, but we'll, we'll get into that when that video comes up. But Yellowstone has a ton of recreational opportunities. These can include like hiking, camping, boating, fishing, and sightseeing. Uh, they also have multiple paved roads that allow for easy and close access to the major th geothermal areas. So like uh, a road that will lead to Old Faithful, like that kind of stuff. It, it's it's for easy access towards these major well-known areas, uh, but they also have roads that go to like your lakes and your waterfalls. Um, and during the winter, because obviously during the winter, roads get, you know, covered and you can't really drive up them anymore. Uh, but during the winter, most visitors often take guided tours through the park that use snow coaches or snow snowmobiles. So that actually sounds really fucking fun. Kind of scary though, because like imagine if you fucking run into a wild animal. But, could you, uh, dude, snow coaches? Hold on. I'm on my computer right now. I want to see. Is that what I think it is? Ah, oh, no, that's not what I th When I heard uh, snow coach, I was thinking. Oh, and it pulled up Yellowstone. <laughs> when I was thinking of a snow coach, I was thinking of like the, I don't know fucking why, but like horse drawn carriages. <laughs> not carriages, but you know the sleds that like the. Uh, is it, it's not horses that lead them, or is it elk? Maybe, I, I'd have to look that up. Um, but no, I was thinking that, but no, they're just gigantic, like, buses that can go into, like, the snow and stuff, which is really cool. Like, if you want to visit during the winter, but, like, you know, you're definitely not, like, a <laughs> expert at hiking in the snow, that's definitely a good option to choose, is just the snow coaches. But yeah, so that's all the ecology. Now we get into the history, which is, I'm sorry, I'm adjusting my chair, arguably our longest section um, the fauna might be the second largest, but history definitely goes for a while, but we're gonna get into it to, you know, hopefully, you know, <laughs> keep this under an hour. But, uh, yeah, so history. The park contains the headwaters of Yellowstone River, which is why it has the name Yellowstone, due to the Yellowstone River, so that's, that's where it takes its name from. In the 18th century, French trappers named the river, I'm going to butcher this and I'm so sorry, uh, Rocher Jeanne Jean, Jean Uh And later, American trappers translated the French name into the English name uh, Yellowstone. It is common to believe that the river was named for the yellow rocks that were seen in uh, what is called like the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Um, they believe that the river was called that because of the, you know, yellow rocks on the side that they saw in the river, so they called it Yellowstone. Uh, the human history of Yellowstone started at least, like, 11,000 years ago, and it first started with, uh, the Native Americans who began to hunt and fish in the region. Uh, in Gardner, Montana, while building the, like, first post office, you know, like, they were, like, building and getting it ready, getting ready for construction, they, uh, dug up an obsidian point. I believe it was like an arrowhead, uh, and that belonged to the, I, I believe it's pronounced Clovis uh, origin, and it was uh, found, like, dated around 11,000 years ago, so that's kind of where we get our 11,000 years ago, is kind of when uh, people started 
you know, living in the Yellowstone region was roughly 11,000 years ago, because we did find that arrowhead. Um, but yeah, so arrowheads f- made from Yellowstone obsidian have been found, like, r- really far away from Yellowstone. Uh, some have been found in, like, Mississippi Valley, which th- that indicated to us uh, that, you know, um, there was trade of, you know, like, of, of obsidian. And it existed between the local, uh, like, tribes that were there. And it even spread, I believe, like, further east. So there was uh, some trade going on with the obsidian and Yellowstone at the time. So when the Lewis and Clark expedition entered what would now be, like, our Montana in, like, 1805, uh, they ran into uh, multiple tribes. They ran into Nez, Nez Pierce, Crow, and Shoshonan tribes. Uh, and they described, so the tribes that they ran into, they described to the crew uh, the Yellowstone region to the south, so kind of like what was going on in the region, that kind of stuff, um, but the Lewis and Clark expedition chose like not to investigate that, and so they just kind of kept on theirs, but they were told of what consisted in that region. Um, in 1806, John Coulter, who was a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, left that group and joined like a group of like fur trappers. Um, and, like, after leaving, uh, the group, like, the Lewis and Clark expedition in, like, 1807, um, no, wait, in 1806, he left the Lewis and Clark expedition, in 1807, he left the fur trapper group he was in, and, um, after he left that, he passed through, like, a portion of what would eventually be, like, the park during, like, the winter of 1807 and 1808. Um, but yeah, and so while passing through that, uh, area of the park, this, this part makes me, like, kind of laugh. It's crazy to think about, but he, he observed one of the geothermal, like, areas and features, which I'm guessing he probably ran into some, like, geysers and stuff like that. That's what I believe they're trying to mention, but I believe that he ran into, like, geysers or other geothermal aspects, uh, in the section which is like to us called Tower Falls, um, he described the place uh, as fire and brimstone. Nobody believed him. <laughs> Nobody believed him that he saw this like these geothermal features. So like uh, your geysers or some I, I believe like volcanic rock or maybe it's just geysers. But he saw this stuff and he went to go described it to you know to them. But nobody believed him and, like, dismissed it as, like, delirium. I believe he was injured at the time, like, going through the park in 1807 to 1890. I believe he was injured. And so when he got there and he was, like, telling them all this stuff, they are like, dude, (laughs) I think you're losing it to delirium, you know? Like, I don't think any of this exists. I think you're just kind of, like, losing blood, like, that kind of stuff. So nobody believed him. Uh, And then eventually... This uh, supposed place that was supposed to exist was nicknamed uh, Coulter's Hell because, you know, he was going through it while he was injured. But yeah, so I found I found that so funny. And it's going to happen again uh, later on where more people are going to go into Yellowstone and they're going to explore it. And they're going to be like, you know, looking at like all these geothermal features, which are like the geysers and the obsidian and like all these like kind of rocks and stuff like that. And then they're going to come back and they're going to tell people like, hey, I saw this stuff. No one's gonna believe him. It happens again. And I'm like, how? How? Like, did, did nobody else who was trustworthy go towards Yellowstone? I, well, I guess not, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, so over the next 40 years, multiple reports from other mountain men and trappers would claim that there was boiling mud, steaming rivers, petrified trees, which there are actually petrified trees in Yellowstone, which I think are really cool, and you should definitely look up petrified trees. They're amazing. Um, but yeah, and mo- for some reason, most of these reports were believed to be myth at the time, that this area didn't exist. Although there were many reports, I guess nobody trusted them. Uh, but yeah, there were multiple other explorations who reported more boiling springs and spouting water and mountains of glass and yellow rock, but most of these reports were dismissed uh, due to the explorer one of them being uh, Jim Bridger, being a, in quotes, spinner of yarn, which is also known as, like, just, like, a liar, like, somebody who tells, like, tall tales, which, it's, it's funny to think, 
Was every single explorer at the time just a spinner of yarn? Did nobody believe them? But I guess not. <laughs> I, I guess not. So although other explorations tried, the first organized survey uh, to enter the Yellowstone region was stopped due to bad weather. And then after that, the American Civil War prevented any further organized explorations until like the late 1860s. So there, there was like attempts to get like a formal one together. The formal one like failed because of, I yeah, like the winter. So, and bad weather. And then Civil War happened and I don't think anybody was caring about national parks and exploring stuff until that was over, so. Uh, but yeah, so the first detailed expedition to Yellowstone area was the, it's three people, Cook, Folsom, and Peterson expedition of 1869. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this consisted of privately funded explorers. So these were people who were like legit funded to explore this area because I believe like nobody had up until this point. So they were actually like, this was your first what you would claim as like your first formal group like these were people who were actually paid to go into like this area not people who just accidentally stumbled upon it um but yeah the Folsom party followed the Yellowstone River to Yellowstone Lake uh, and the members kept a journal and based on the information in that journal uh but yeah well yeah the members kept a journal and based on the info it reported that a group of Montana residents organized the Washburn, Langford, Dona Expedition in 1870, which would explore Wyoming's part of Yellowstone. So that expedition was led by Surver, Surveyor General of Montana, Henry Henry Washburn, including Nathaniel Langford, and had an army detachment commander by Lieutenant Gustavus Doan. Doan. Uh, this exploration explored the region, collecting specimens and naming sites of interests. And throughout the years, many different people stated that the region should be set aside and protected as a national park. Even a congressman, William D. Kelly, suggested that, in his in quotes, Congress pass a bill reserving the Great Geyser Basin as a public park forever. Uh, and now we're going to get into the park creation. So that was kind of like the exploration. Everyone exploring, nobody really getting far. And then we kind of we had our like first explorations, but we had like some where it was like, uh... It just mentioned, you know, basically, like, what they were doing, you know, what they got there. And then we had our final one, which was the Washburn, Langford, and Doan ex expedition, which really got, like, specimens and, you know, naming sites of interest. That kind of stuff really started to solidify what would be Yellowstone. But then we get into park creation, which is like your congress kind of stuff which is going to be like a lot of people basically begging uh congress to please set this aside make this area a national park protect it you know like that kind of stuff um but in 1871 11 years after his first failed effort ferdinand hayden was finally able to explore the region he was sponsored by the government which allowed him to return to the region with a second and larger expedition called the Hayden Geological Survey of 1871. A lot of these people liked to name the surveys after themselves. Like, it's not like a team name. It's literally just, like, uh, what is it? His is called uh, Hayden Geological Survey. The other ones are, like, all three of their last names put together. So they, they really love themselves. Um... But he did end up making a comprehensive report, and in this report it had, like, large format photographs by uh, William Henry Jackson and then paintings by Thomas Morgan. And this report, this exact one, with the photos and the paintings, would eventually convince the U.S. Congress to withdraw the region from public election, so nobody could buy this region anymore. It didn't make it a national park, don't, it, don't get me wrong, it didn't make it a national park. But at the same time, it made sure that at that time, nobody could buy it. So nobody could, like, you know, pay for it and then have control of that land. Uh, and then finally, on March 1st, 1872, President Grant signed the Act of Dedication Law, which created Yellowstone National Park. So, uh, literally, probably, I don't know exactly when... 
it was, uh, what is it, removed from public auction, but, like, this was, like, the expiration was in 1872, and then in 1870, or 1871 was the expiration, 1872 was when it was signed into law that it was a national park. So, during that time, the report convinced them to pull it from public auction, and then it was just created a national park. Um, but I did think it would be interesting to read to you guys the act of dedication, and so I thought I would do that. Uh, I do have it here. Pardon me, because it's, it's definitely old. It's 1872, so I'll try my best to read the act of dedication, which is the law that turned uh, the park into Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone National Park. So, an act to set apart a certain tract of land lying near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River as a public park, be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the tract of land in the territories of Montana and Wyoming is hereby reserved and withdrawn from settlement, occupancy, or sale under the laws of the United States, and dedicated and set apart as a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, and all persons who shall locate or settle upon or occupy the same or any part thereof, except as in as here and after provided, shall be considered trespassers and removed therefrom. Approved March 1st, 1872, signed by Eusilia, U, U, oh my god, Eusilius, <laughs> Grant, uh, President of the United States, Schuler Colfax, Vice President of the United States and the President of the Senate, and James G. Blaine, Speaker of the House. And that is the act of dedication. I thought it'd be interesting to read to hear exactly what they had to say uh, about, you know, solidifying the park. But yeah, though. So, although it seems that we are, like, done with the history of, you know, Yellowstone since it is technically uh, considered, you know, a national park, uh, we're still far from done. Because <laughs> although they, like, um... Although they got it to be a national park, it was definitely not as protected as it is today, and so there was still problems to be had and stuff to fix, which we'll get into, uh, but it, it had a lot of stuff we had to fix before it is now the park we know today. So, although Hayden, who was the uh, the one in the expedition that convinced the, them to like pull it from public auction, was not the only person to have thought of creating this area as like a national park, in Yellowstone, he was considered the first and, like, most enthusi and, like, enthusiastic advocate. Like, he was out there, out there. So he was considered, like, one of the, like, the first and, like, you know, most prominent people who wanted that to be protected. Uh, but yeah. So in his words, which I have right here, he believed in setting aside the area as a pleasure ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. And he also warned that there are those who make merchandise of these beautiful specimens, and he concluded that the site should be as free as the air or water. In his report to the Committee uh, committee on Public Lands, he concluded that if the bill failed to become law, so if the National Park wasn't protected, uh, the vandals who are now waiting to enter into this wonderland will, in a single season, despoil beyond recovery these remarkable curiosities which have required all the cunning skill of nature thousands of years to prepare. And do I believe him on that? Oh, fuck yeah. Dude, if they had not passed a bill, like, I'm being dead honest with you, if they had not passed a bill or anything like that to literally protect Yellowstone, it would be gone. As of, like, today, it would be gone. And, like, I say that because, like, let's say this bill this bill had failed. Like, like what he's imagining, if the bill had failed. Could you imagine telling people that like there's this land that is so pretty and has so many trees and so many different rocks and stuff you know and they're like we should protect it we should protect it you know like you don't want people messing with this land right and then all of a sudden it's not protected anymore and it's a free-for-all oh people are gonna go fucking crazy i mean like even after it became a private you know kind of like it was a public land but it's still considered very you know like you can't really just go, you know, chop down trees in the park, you know. So it's considered public, but it's considered, you know, kind of locked down. Even now, when it's being watched by, like, the National Park Service, there's still fucking people who go in and 
kill the animals and do like illegal shit. So it's like, if that was free for all, the park would be gone. And I, I stand by that. I really do believe, yeah, the park would be gone. Um, but yeah, so thanks to Hayden and the party uh, that he was on with the expedition, they recognized that Yellowstone was a unique place, that it should be, you know, available for further research and enjoyment of the public. He encouraged a lot of people that they should preserve it for others to see and experience, considering that it is a great park, it's great nature, like, you know, it's, it's something, like, it's, it's beautiful, you know, like, we might as well preserve it, um, but yeah, so although the park was not a set aside for, like, strictly just, like, ecological purposes, which is, like, research, um, the designation of a, in quotes, like, pleasure ground did not mean that people could just create whatever they wanted in the park, like, you're not about to have, like, an amusement park in there, uh, Hayden believed, the explorer, uh, that it would be something close to, like, your, uh, your scenic resorts, so, like, the baths in England, Germany, and Switzerland, that's what he, like, pointed out, that's what he kind of thought, like, for pleasure ground, like, it was gonna be just, like, kind of like a scenic resort, like, still you're keeping, you know, the nature there, but, like, you know, you're still allowing people to visit and have a reason to, uh, but yeah, so there was, uh, at the time, although we think, like, everyone agreed that you know, Yellowstone is such a beautiful park and that should be saved, there was actually a good amount of, like, local opposition to Yellowstone becoming a national park during the first years after it was created. Uh, many feared that the economy problems, uh, like, that there would be economy problems because, like, uh, local entrepreneurs, so, like, your uh, trappers and loggers, they weren't able to use any of the resources on the land, so they were worried that, you know, there was going to be ecological problems because, you know, you live there, but you can't cut down any of the wood there, you know, you can't go get any of, like, the animals, so there were, there was valid worry at the time that, you know, like, there's gonna be problems if you live near Yellowstone because you can't do your job, which is a valid, valid thought, like, you know, like, I would, <laughs> shoot, dude, if you were a logger at that time and, you know, you're, you're in that area and then all of a sudden you hear, like, oh, no, it's been, it's been locked down, you, you can't do this, I, I'd be <laughs> fucking worried as shit. Um, but due to all these worries, there were bills that were introduced to Congress, uh, by Montana representatives that they should remove the federal land use restrictions. Um, after the first, uh, after the park's, like, official creation, Nathaniel Langford became appointed the park's first superintendent in 1872 by Columbus Delano. Uh, Langford served five years, but... Surprise, surprise, uh, he was never given a salary, never funded, didn't have any staff, um, so he couldn't do anything. Like, <laughs> in all honesty, I don't know what they expected him to do. You're not funding the man. You're not giving him a salary. You're not giving him any staff. You're kind of fucking him over. Uh, so he couldn't improve anything in the land, and he also couldn't properly even protect the park. Uh, like... He had no formal policies or regulations, and he had very few ways to even enforce the protection that he was told he had to enforce. Um, so that meant that during the time that Langford was serving, Yellowstone was open to poachers, vandals, and other people that wanted to steal the resources of the park. So, in 1875, Colonel William Ludlow was sent to document the new Yellowstone National Park, and what exactly was going on, like, in the park. He was sent to document that kind of stuff. So, like, how is going? How's the park? What's going on? How is Langford leading it? And he documented that the park was extremely lawless, <laughs> uh, and that there was a ton of exploitation to the park. I'm not surprised, uh, but yeah, so that they were losing resources in the park, that nobody was really watching this. Um, but in this report, there was also uh, attachments by another member. Uh, he was a naturalist and a minerolo mineralogist, I can pronounce it, uh, and a mineralogist named George Bird Grinnell. Uh, is someone car going? <laughs> Hold on. I hope you guys can't hear that. Someone's car is, like, fucking going wild. Um... 
But in Grinnell's documents, he noted uh, that poachers, or he noted on poachers about them, that it is estimated that during the winter of 1874 to 1875, not less than 3,000 buffalo and mule deer suffered uh, even more severely than the elk and the antelope nearly as much. Yeah, so 3,000. Think about that. Oh my god. Like, you're sitting there, and I'm, I'm trying to, like, think of, like, what would we do with 3,000? Like, now, we have, like, a lot of people, you know, like, our population's huge. But, like, back then, you know, the population was a little bit smaller. What are y'all doing with 3,000 buffalo and mule deer? What? Um, but anyways, as, uh, as a result of this document and what was found... Langford was forced to step down in 1877, uh, and afterwards, somebody named Philetus, Philetus? I believe that's how you pronounce it, Norris, volunteered for the position. He wanted to do this, uh, and funnily enough, Congress finally decided to implement a salary for the position and also provided very minimal funding to Norris. Uh, funny enough, they did this after fucking Langford was, like, forced to step down. Could you imagine being known as, like, somebody who let the park turn kind of, like, lawless because you didn't have any fucking funding, and then the person next, like, the person who, like, steps up after you gets your fucking funding and your salary, I would be so fucking pissed. I'd be like, you made me do this for five years without a salary, and then I get told to step down, and the next person, he gets a salary? (sighs) Where's my five years of pay, dude? Uh, but anyways... Uh, Norris took the funding that he was giving and built uh, a lot of, like, crude roads and other facilities. Very, very, like, minimal kind of, like, not effort, but, you know, like, they didn't have a lot. It was very minimal funding, so you couldn't really do too much. Uh, But in 1888... Sorry. In 1888, Harry Yount, I believe it's pronounced... Uh, was appointed as a gamekeeper to control poaching and vandalism in the park. Yont had experience uh, for exploring mountains. He had previously uh, explored what would what we would be considering uh, the Grand Tetons in like Wyoming. He had explored those, uh, and yeah. So Yont is the first ever national park ranger. He's considered the first ever national park ranger, and a area in Yellowstone called Yont's Pink Peak. Yon's Peak, uh, which is at the head of the Yellowstone River, is named in his honor, considering that he is the first National Park Ranger. Uh, however, all these efforts to protect the park would fail in Norris's time, uh, and the next three superintendents' time. So it wasn't just Lang, uh, it wasn't just Langford and Norris who had trouble. It would be the next following three superintendents after them that also had trouble. And it was due to the fact that they didn't have sufficient manpower or the resources to do anything. They they had just gotten a salary and very minimal funding. You really think they're going to be able to do too much with that? They, they weren't. So it, it did fail for the next uh, three superintendents after Norris. Um, during that the years, though, many railways would be built to help increase visitation uh Although this visitation that they were trying to build fell off immensely by World War II, uh, and it, eventually this the trainways and all that kind of stuff, it ceased because a lot of people had automobiles. So railways kind of disappeared in the 1960s. Um, all these early visitors, they would have to endure very poor and like dusty roads and very limited service to get to Yellowstone, uh, considering... No fucking funding, (laughs) or, like, very minimal funding. So these roads were very crude. They were dirt roads, dusty, that kind of stuff. So it's definitely a little bit harder to get to Yellowstone. It was a lot more. It's not as easy as it is, like, nowadays. Uh, But, yeah. So during the 1870s and 1880s, Native American tribes were eventually excluded from the National Park. Under half a dozen tribes made seasonal use of the park. The only year-round residents were small bands of Eastern Shoshonen. Um, the Eastern Shoshonen left their area under the assurance of a treaty, which was negotiated in 1868, which meant that the Eastern Shoshonen uh, 
um, that the Eastern Shoshonan uh, ceded their lands but still retained the right to hunt in Yellowstone. Uh, the U.S. never ratified the treaty and refused to recognize the claims of the Eastern Shoshonan or any other tribe that had used Yellowstone. Uh, eventually, the, uh, the Nez Pierce Band associated with uh, Chief Joseph, numbering like 750, passed through Yellowstone in 13 days in the late August 1877. They were being pursued by the U.S. Army and entered the park about two weeks after the Battle of the Big Hole. Some of the Nez Pierce were friendly to the tourists and other people they encountered in the park, while some were not. Despite Joseph and other chiefs ordering that no one should be harmed, uh, at least two people were killed and several were wounded. One of the areas where in uh, encounters had occurred was in the Lower Geyser Basin and east along an area of the Firehole River to Mary Mountain and beyond. The stream is still known as Nez, Priest, uh, Nez Pierce Creek, and in the aftermath of the East Shoshonan Native American War of 1879, Norris built a fort to prevent uh, any Native Americans from entering the national park. Poaching and destruction of natural resources continued to happen until eventually the U.S. Army arrived at Mammoth Hot Springs in 1886 uh, and built Camp Sheridan. Over the following 22 years, the Army would build permanent structures uh, and Camp Sheridan was eventually renamed uh, Fort Yellowstone. So, on May 7th, 1894, the Boone and Crockett Club, which was acting through the people of George G. Vest, Arnold Hague, William Hallett Phillips, W.A. Wadsworth, Archibald Rogers, Theodore Roosevelt, and George Bird Grinnell, were successful in getting the Park Protection Act going, which eventually would save this park. Uh, with, finally, finally, the funding and manpower necessary to keep a diligent watch the army developed its own policies and regulations that allowed public access to the park, but also kept the protections of like wildlife and national resource, uh, natural resources. Uh, eventually, the National Park Service was created in 1916, and many of the army's policies were eventually uh, adopted by the National Park Service. Uh, in 1918, uh, on October 31st, the Army eventually turned over control to the National Park Service, uh, and in 1898, the naturalist John Muir described the park, and I believe this is a great uh, description of the park, uh, so I'll read it to you now. Uh, However orderly your excursions or aimless, again and again amid, amid the calmest, stillest scenery, you will be brought to a standstill, hushed and awe-stricken, before phenomena wholly new to you. Boiling springs and huge deep pools of purest green and azure water. Thousands of them are splashing and heaving in these high, cool mountains as if a fierce furnace fire were burning beneath each one of them. And a hundred geysers, while torrent, white torrent of boiling water and steam, like inverted waterfalls, are ever and anon rushing up and out of the hot, black underworld. It just sounds so pretty. Like, I understand it's not, like, a 100% like percent great description of the park, but I like it. I mean, you got the, like, descriptions there of, like, awe-stricken phenomenon of, like, your geysers and your geothermal stuff, your azure water. It just sounds so beautiful. It's so nice. Uh, but, yeah, so that is considered what I would consider, like, the early history of the park, like, just before it's created. It got created, and now we're here. But now we're going to start getting into the later history, which is more like after the park's been created, now we have the National Park Service. This is their kind of stuff. This is what they're kind of doing, their history. So we're going to go get into their history. Uh, so by 1915, uh, there were many automobiles entering this park, uh, which resulted in a lot of conflicts with uh, horses and like other horse-drawn transportation during the time. And eventually horse like horse transportation was completely prohibited on roads uh, including just riding a horse was prohibited the civilian conservation corps also called the ccc which is what i'm going to be calling it from now on uh which came from the new deal relief agency for young men became a major role between the years of 1933 and 1942 in developing a ton of the yellowstone facilities we have uh some of the cc products were reforestation, campground development, trail construction, fire hazard reduction, and firefighting work. So, 
basically, uh, the CC products, uh, or the CC projects, uh, and the CC are who we can thank for all of the very early visitor centers, your campgrounds, and the current system of park roads that we use. You can thank them. So, during World War II, tourist, uh, you know, travel to the park fell, and the park suffered. Staff got laid off, and many different faculties fell into disrepair. No one was going, there was no funding. Uh, so it kind of died for a bit, minute. Um, but by the 1950s, t- visitation fucking spiked to Yellowstone. They had a ton of visitors, along with many of the other national parks at the time, got a ton of visitors. I mean, think about it. Like, after World War II, everyone's back. Let's go to a national park. And so it kind of, it, you know, they got a ton of visitation. So to handle this very sharp increase at the time, uh, Mission 66 was implemented and they were going to try to finish this project uh, by 1966 to honor the National Park Service's 50th anniversary. So all of the projects in this mission, they wanted to finish it by then to be like, hey, look, we're done. It's the 50th anniversary. Hurrah. Uh, so during the late 18, or 18, oops, during the late 1980s, most buildings and constructions in Yellowstone reverted back to, like, the traditional design, um, after the giant forest fire in 1988 fucking wiped everything out, basically. Uh, I mean, just think about it, it burned, I believe, like, two-thirds? I believe it was two-thirds of the fucking park. So yeah, they had to rebuild a lot of it. Uh, and so a lot of those ones that had to be rebuilt were- they went back to the traditional design. Uh, this forest fire destroyed a lot of Grant Village, and those structures were also rebuilt back in the traditional style. The visitor center at Canyon Village, which opened in 2006, uh, also uses a more traditional style, so if you've been there, you kind of know what it is. Um, in 1959, there was an earthquake called Hebegen Lake Earthquake, which damaged roads and multiple different structures in the park. Because of this earthquake, many new geysers were founded, uh, and many existing hot springs had become, like, cloudy and, like, murky uh, due to the earthquake. So that earthquake was the most powerful earthquake to hit the region in recorded history. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, like, that's that's their talk about earthquakes. We're going to get into, like, some uh, animal stuff right now, but... Yeah, so the Hebegen Lake Earthquake was uh, the most powerful earthquake to hit the region. And there's there's been some stuff about earthquake, but we'll get, we'll get into that when we get near the earthquake section. In 1963, there were several years of, like, public controversy over how Yellowstone was, like, purposely reducing their elk population. So they were, like, purposely going out there and, like, you know, ending some elk to help, you know keep the population, uh, you know, culling is kind of what it's called. Um, but the Secretary of the Interior, uh, at the time, Stuart Udall, appointed somebody to collect, like, scientific data on, like, all the other national parks and realized that all the other national parks' culling programs had failed, except for Yellowstone's, which was working. So in the end, although there was a lot of, you know, uh, public controversy about how Yellowstone was culling their elk, eventually, all the other programs had to take Yellowstone's way of culling, um, which is funny to think, but (laughs) yeah. So, uh, the wildlife that occurred, um, or the wildfires that occurred in 1988 were the largest to ever happen in the park. Uh, we're gonna get into a little bit of it, but I do want to cover this in another part, so take that as you will, but approximately 793 thousand eight hundred and eighty acres or 36 percent of the park was affected by the fires these fires led to a systematic reevaluation of fire management policies so because we'll get into it but because of the way they were managing fire like fires at the time they were kind of the fire was able to just explode and they had to be like okay pause let's rethink how we're managing our fire stuff um But in the beginning of the fire season of 1988, it was considered, like, normal. Uh, The combination, uh, until, like, a certain combination of weather occurred, it was, like, fine. There was no big warning signs. It was perfectly okay. 
with a mix of drought and heat by mid-July, this contributed to it a like extreme fire danger. So you have your drought and you have your heat, and now there is giant fire damage or like a fire danger. Uh, and what is known as Black Saturday, uh, on August twentieth, nineteen eighty-eight, strong winds made the fires expand rapidly, which caused one thousand, one wait, one hundred fifty thousand acres to burn. Um, which is crazy to think about, but that's that's as much as we're gonna get into the fire. I will talk about it later. Um, but that's as far as we're gonna get. Uh, over one thousand archaeological sites have been discovered uh, in the park. And the park has 1,106 historical structures and other features. Um, some other landmarks, the Obsidian Cliffs and, like, five buildings near it have been designated as, like, National Historical Landmarks. Um, and Yellowstone was also designated an International Biosphere Reserve on October 26, 1976, and a UN World Heritage Site on September 9, 1978. From 1955 to 2003, due to the effects of tourism, infection of wildlife, and issues with invasive species, the park was placed on the list of world heritage in danger. And in 2010, Yellowstone National Park was honored with its own quarter under the America, America the Beautiful Quarters program. So, uh, another interesting part of the park is the Heritage and Research Center, which is located at Gardner, Montana, near the north entrance of the park. This center is home to the park's museum collections, the archives, research, library, historian, uh, archaeological lab, lab, and herbarium. 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 Yep. Uh, but yeah, so. The Yellowstone Archives maintain collections of historical records of Yellowstone and the National Park Service. The collection includes, like, administ uh, administrative records of Yellowstone, resource management records, major project records, uh, manuscripts, and personal papers, uh, and these ar uh, archives are affiliated with the National Archives and Records Administrations. Um, so far, that is all the history that has happened and that I can find about the Yellow, uh, Yellowstone National Park. We'll be moving into some other categories that I thought would be interesting to cover uh, besides just the history. So we'll be covering uh, geology, geography, ecology, and biology of the park. So if you're only here to learn about like the history and like kind of stuff like that, um, you can skip to the end if you want to. But for now, we're going to start on uh, our geography, which I had a lot of fun. This is definitely, this is going to be more about like the lakes, the rivers, the canyons, you know, those kind of stuff, which I find very interesting. I love uh, hearing like statistics about parks. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to get into that. So, approximately 96% of the park is located within Wyoming, 3% is only located in Montana, and the last 1% is located in Idaho. The park is 63 miles long north to south and 54 miles long east to west. Yellowstone is uh, 2,219,789 acres in area, which is larger than the states of Delaware and Rhode Island. Um, rivers and lakes cover up 5% of this area, and the Yellowstone Lake is the largest body of water, and it covers 87,040 uh, acres. It is also 400 feet deep and has 110 miles of shoreline. At an elevation of 7,733 feet above sea level, Yellowstone Lake is considered the largest high elevation lake in North America. So, uh, forests come, uh, Forests do comp uh, compromise 80% of the park, and the rest is considered, like, grasslands. Uh, the Continental Divide of North America runs diagonally through the southwestern part of the park, and about one-third of the park lies on the west side of the divide, uh, which, as a result, the water of the Snake River flow to the Pacific Ocean, while those of the Yellowstone River uh, find their way to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this, the park sits on Yellowstone Plateau, which has an average elevation of, like, 8,000 feet above sea level. The plateau is surrounded on nearly all sides by mountain ranges of the middle Rocky Mountains. Uh, these can range from, like, 9,000 to 11,000 feet in elevation. Um, the highest point in the park is at the very top of Eagle Peak, and the lowest point is along, uh, like, Reese Creek. There are nearby uh, mountain ranges, which include the Galton Range in the northwest, the Beartooth Mountains in the north, 
The Absarco, uh, co wait. The Absaroka range to the east and the Teton range to the south and then the Madison range to the west. However, the most prominent summit on the Yellowstone Plateau is Mount Washburn, which is at 10,243 feet. Uh, the park has one of the largest uh, petrified forests, which just means that, like, the trees long ago had been, like, buried in ash, and, like, uh, they eventually, like, turned into, um, they turned from, like, wood to mineral materials, and then uh, the volcanic ash is believed to have come from the park itself because, as we know, Yellowstone is a gigantic supervolcano. So the park contains 290 waterfalls, uh, which they all are at least like 15 feet tall, um, but the highest, which is at the lower falls of the Yellowstone River, uh, is at 308 feet tall. Uh, there are three deep canyons in the park that cut through volcanic tuff, uh, by the rivers for like so the rivers ran through this area for like 640,000 years and then eventually cut these canyons um so the lewis river flows through the lewis canyon in the south the yellowstone the yellowstone river has carved two canyons one called the grand canyon of the yellowstone and the other called the black canyon uh on the river's journey to the north and that's about as much of the uh Ge uh, geography that we do have of the park that I could find. We're going to focus on the geology, which is like your geothermal stuff um, and I believe volcanic stuff. So this is this is also very interesting. I do find this interesting. But Yellowstone is at the northeastern end of the Snake River Plain that extends roughly 400 miles from the park to the Idaho-Oregon border. Yellowstone is the active part of a hotspot that has moved northeast over time, and the origin of the hotspot volcano, uh, volcanism is disputed. Yellowstone Caldera, I believe it's called a caldera, is the largest volcanic system in North America, and worldwide it is only rivaled by Lake Toba Caldera on Sumatra. It has been termed a supervolcano because uh, the caldera was formed by a large explosive eruption. The Curtin Caldera, which uh, we know was created by a cataclysmic eruption that occurred 640,000 years ago, uh, that eruption was 1,000 times larger than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helen, and many of the explosions created different a like areas in the park. Like this one explosion created, um, what is it? They created Lava Creek Tuff, Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, Island Park Caldera, Henry's Fork Caldera, and Mesa Falls Tuff. All because of, like, the ash and volcanic material that was disposed by this eruption. Um, the amounts of gas and ash that was released during the eruption, which I find very interesting. So, years ago, during this eruption, it led to significant changes in the world weather patterns and led to the extinctions of, like, some animals, primarily in North America. But could you think of, like, a volcano that killed animals we don't even know existed and now they're extinct like it's wild i find it like amazing like just what um but anyways a subsequent caldera forming eruption occurred about 160,000 years ago it formed a small caldera that contains the west thumb of yellowstone lake and since the last series of eruptions the yellowstone caldera has nearly filled with 80 different eruptions of Relotic lava, ones that can be seen at Obsidian Cliffs, and uh, bals basaltic lava, which can be seen at uh, Sheep Eater Cliff. So, lava strata can be easily seen at the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, and each eruption is part of a eruptive cycle that climaxes and causes the partial collapse of the roof of the volcano's partially emptied magma chamber. This creates a collapsed depression called a caldera and releases a vast amount of volcanic ash. So now we kind of get into the geysers, which are our geothermal areas. So the most famous geyser in the park is Old Faithful, which is located in the upper geyser basin. Some other geysers that are roughly in the same basin are called uh, Castle Geyser, Lion Geyser, Beehive Geyser, Grand Geyser, Giant Geyser, Riverside Geyser. I feel like I'm saying geyser wrong. Anyways, it just it's starting to sound like not a word anymore. So, although uh, Old Faithful is the most famous geyser in the park, 
The tallest active geyser is actually Steamboat Geyser in the Norse Geyser Basin. Geyser is starting to not sound like a word anymore. Um, a study in 2011 has shown that at least 1,283 geysers have erupted in Yellowstone. Of the ones that have erupted, only 465 are active in a given year. So although altogether Yellowstone contains like 10,000 geothermal features, which these can include like your geysers, your hot springs, mud pots, and fumaroles, over half of the world's geysers and other hydrothermal features are considered in Yellowstone. Um, in May 2001, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Nas uh, Yellowstone National Park, and the University of Utah helped create the Yellowstone Vol Volcano Ob Observatory, so the YVO. Uh, this group was created for long-term monitoring of the geological changes in Yellowstone Park. Um, this considers, like, watching, you know, for, like, you know, just watching, watching the park in case anything happens with the volcanic rock, uh, just observing it. But... This I found very interesting. On March 10th, 2004, a biologist found five dead bison, which had apparently inhaled toxic geothermal gases that were trapped in the Norris Geyser Basin by a seasonal atmospheric inversion. Yeah, could you just imagine stumbling upon, like, five fucking dead bison? And they probably didn't have any, like, apparent death. Like, they just- it looked like they probably just, like, fell dead to find out that they died from inhaling fucking toxic- gases I'd be fucking terrified um but anyways there have been six earthquakes with at least a magnitude of six or greater in historical times uh including the 7.2 magnitude Hebegin Lake earthquake which occurred in 1959 uh the Hebegin earthquake uh caused a huge landslide which caused a partial dam to collapse on Hebegin Lake and the sediment from the landslide dammed the river and created a new lake, which is now called Earthquake Lake. Uh, 28 people were killed and property damage was extensive due to this earthquake. Uh, and now seismic activity in Yellowstone National Park continues and is reported hourly by the Earthquake Hazards Program of the U.S. Geological Survey. So now we get into my favorite, favorite section uh, the biology and eco ecology, I believe. This means we're gonna, you, you're gonna hear me talk about animals. You're stuck here. For, forever. Forever. We're just gonna talk about so many animals. I'm excited. Okay, so, before I keep, you know, telling you about how excited I am, uh, the Yellowstone National Park is the centerpiece of the 200, nope, 20 million. Yep, I can read. <laughs> Uh, is the centerpiece of the 20 million acres of the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. Uh, so this, I read about this and I had to put this in here. Um, with the successful wolf reintroduction program, which started in the 1990s, many of the original fauna and flora species known to live in the area when the first explorers entered can still be found. So what they were uh, talking about is basically, we'll get into it a little while later, um, but at some point... For some reason, they decided they were going to exterminate a lot of the wolves in the area, which meant that eventually the wolves weren't there anymore. And so to try to prevent them from disappearing entirely from Yellowstone, they tried a reintroduction program. It worked, which now means that you can still find wolves in the Yellowstone, which allows them to say that uh, the flora and fauna species you can stumble upon in Yellowstone technically uh, were there when the first explorers were there because you could still find them. Um, but yeah, otherwise if we had lost the wolves then it would be kind of harder to say that because, you know, there's no more wolves in Yellowstone. But thankfully we were able to uh, reintroduce them and they were able to stay. But uh, Yellowstone is the home to a key field observation site for the National Ecological Observation Network. Over 69,000, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to keep laughing when I see that number, uh, over 69,000 species of trees and other vascular plants are native to the park, and 170 of these species are considered to be exotic and are non-native. Out of the eight con confere tree species documented, the lodgepole pine forest covers 80% of the total forest areas. 
Some other similar trees are the subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, and Rocky Mountain Douglas fir, and whitebark pine, which are scattered throughout the park. The whitebark pine has been threatened by a white fungus, which seems to affect the trees to the north and west, and those uh, trees are still getting attacked and threatened, as I can see. I've done research. I looked because um, the research I had found was, like, back a while back. It was, like, 2000-something. Um, and so I was, I was checking up recently. I like, are they still getting attacked by this white fungus? And as far as I could find, they were still uh, in a threatened state due to this fungus. I don't think they've gotten rid of it yet. Um... Quaking aspen and willows, uh, that's my name, uh, are the most common tree species of Ducidius trees, uh, which means that, Ducidius means, like, uh, that they lose their leaves in autumn, so the trees that you see that, like, change colors and then die and then you just have twigs in your yard, um, th those are Ducidius, um, but yeah, so, they're, com they're the common species of tree you can find. Uh, but due to the reintroduction of wolves in the environment, the grazing habits of elks have changed, uh, and thus, um, aspine forests are recently recovering. So, aspine forests, uh, what that means is basically, when I said that they were killing a lot of wolves, they were killing a lot of wolves to the point that, uh, canines became, um, you know, kind of like the lead, so elks grew fucking crazy, like, you don't have any of the big, you know, canine species to, you know, cull the elk population. So they went crazy and they were kind of endangering your, uh, your aspine trees. So eventually, due to the reintroduction of wolves, they were able to recover and are currently recovering, I believe. Um, but there are dozens of species of flowering plants. Um, however, the Yellowstone sand verbena is a rare plant, which, get this, is only found in Yellowstone. I looked it up and it is a gorgeous plant plant species it is beautiful I don't know it like it's gorgeous and it's only found there so I'll have to make that a goal to go see that um but it is close to other species which are usually found in warmer warmer climates so technically um this plant is an enigma it it does they don't understand how it's there um there are roughly 8,000 of them and they make home they make their home above uh the water line so, in the hot waters of the Yellowstone, so like in your geothermal areas, uh, bacteria form micro micro uh, micro microbial. I, I know how to pronounce it, it's just not there. Mats, which consist of like bizarre shapes and trillions of individual cells. Um, but these bacterium, which are found in the Yellowstone hot springs, can be very useful for science, and th they kind of are. One bacteria, uh, Thermus aquaticus, is used in replicating DNA as part of the PCR process, and some scientists think that these uh, bacteria that can be found in these hot springs can eventually cure uh, various diseases. They haven't gotten there yet, but they do believe it is possible. Um, as always, uh, exotic plants are known to be threatening to native plants, and uh, most of these exotic plants can be found near public and popular areas. Uh, but they can spread deeper into the park and are very dangerous to some native plants. So, when you see those signs, uh, this goes, I've seen them some places, but there's certain stuff that say, like, hey, when leaving this area, make sure you don't have this on your boat or your car or something like that. And when people don't properly check their boats, their cars, whatever, that is when we could get an exotic creature plant or something into an area that it shouldn't be and then it becomes an invasive species and then we are slowly killing the native plants of the area it's just all around not a good thing so be be on the lookout for stuff like that so that we can keep these uh environments alive uh, just you know a little bit longer like you know let's just let's keep them going while we can there are almost 60 species of mammals in the park some of these are the Rocky Mountain Wolf, your coyotes, the Canadian lynx, cougars, uh, black and grizzly bears. Uh, some other large mammals include your bisons, your elk, your moose, your mu mule deer. Mule deer? I believe that's called. Uh, your white-tailed deer, your mountain goat, your pronghorn, and your bighorn sheep. So the Yellowstone Park Bison Herd is the largest public herd of American bison in the United States. 
bison used to have 30 to 60 million uh, of them, but now Yellowstone is one of the last places they are. Um, the park bison uh, in 2005 hit their peak at 4,900, and in 2008 dropped to 3,000 after a harsh winter and a problem with Brucellius. Um, Brucellius is a bacteria. It's We'll get into it. I can see it coming up, but we'll get into it. So the park bison are one of the only four free roaming and pure herds on public land in North America. The other three herds are located in Henry Mountain, or the Henry Mountain Bison Herd in Utah, the Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota, and the Elk Island National Park in Alberta. So the bison population is a species that can transmit uh, bovine diseases to domestic cows. And about half of the bison population in the park has been exposed to Brucellius, which is a bacteria that came from uh, European cattle that can cause the mammal to have a, uh, to miscarry. The disease has little effect on the bison. Uh, they really don't have any problem with it. Uh, and there has not been any reported case of the bison passing the disease to domestic cows, uh, and none, nothing has ever been filed about it. However, the APHIS believes that the bison are the likely source of the spread of the disease in Wyoming and North Dakota. Elks also happen to carry the disease and are believed to have passed the infection to horses and cattle. Uh, to combat the problem with Brucellios, uh, National Park Rangers will regularly herd the bison back into the park when they tend to venture outside the area's borders. However, since they do sometimes get out of the park's borders, during 1996 to 1997, the bison that did venture out of the park um, were either shot or sent to a slaughter, and it was believed that there was 1,079 bison that were killed. Um, a lot of people were pissed. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people were pissed about this and believed that this was cruel that the bison were merely moving due to areas uh, that the bison used to graze that had been turned into fucking cattle grazing. Thus, they got pushed out. Think about it this, right? You graze at an area all the time. You know, this is your area. It's in your park. You're in your safe boundary. And then all of a sudden, now there are domestic cattle grazing in it. And you're being pushed out. You can't graze there anymore. It's not like these, uh, these farmers are going to let you graze. So you've been pushed out. And, you know, you're, you're not... You don't know where this imaginary line is on this park where you're safe and where you're not. And so you cross it. And then all of a sudden you're taken or you're killed or you're shot. And it's like, they don't know. You know, like, I, it pissed me off that a park would have areas where cattle grazing can be, which pushes the bison out. It's like, why? Why isn't that area that now cattle are grazing, why wasn't that made into bison grazing? You know, like, why isn't... Why wasn't it kept that way? So I, I understand why a lot of people were mad. So, yeah, I would be pissed too. Uh, the APHIS has stated that the vaccinations uh, and other ways that the brucellus can be eliminated from the bison and elk herds. Uh, starting in 1914, to protect elk populations, the U.S. used funds to destroy wolves, prairie dogs, and other animals. And by 1926, they had killed 136 wolves and... Eventually, the wolves are almost non-existent in Yellowstone. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, which started in 1973, uh, the wolf was one of the first on their lists at the time because they were almost gone. Uh, after the wolves were gone, the coyote became the top canine predator, um, but coyotes are small. If you've ever been around a coyote, they're not that big. Uh, but yeah, so coyotes are small. They're not they're not giant creatures, and hmm, they're not giant creatures, and they can't kill large game so quickly, so um, old and sick prey eventually increased. So eventually the federal government realized, oh shit, wolves are important, we gotta start a reintroduction program for wolves. We fucked up immensely. We, huh, we took a predator out of an environment. It can't be that bad, right? Yeah, no, they realized they fucked up. Uh, and so they started a reintroduction program for wolves. Now more than half of the wolves in Yellowstone are descendants of the first 
66 wolves that were introduced in 1995 to 1996. Uh, and officially, on February 27, 2008, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service removed the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf from the endangered list. Huzzah! We were... Thank God we were able to save them. Good God. Um, officially, or black bears, we're, we're moving on to black bears now. Uh, black bears are very common for the park due to visitor interactions with the bears in the 1910s. Uh, I believe people were told that they could feed black bears. No, don't do that. Don't fucking feed anything in the parks. I don't want... <laughs> if, if you visit a national park, I better not hear anybody who's listening to this that you are feeding any wild animal. Stop it. Because then that wild animal is going to get used to you and it's going to want, it's going to be like, oh, humans give me food. And so it's going to keep going to humans and then there's going to be an accident and then they're going to fucking kill the animal because it doesn't fucking know. So stop feeding animals. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, feeding and close interactions with the bears were prohibited in the 1960s. So it eventually stopped by then, I believe. But yeah, stop feeding animals. Uh, Yellowstone is one of the only places in the United States where black bears and gri grizzly bears can be seen uh, coexisting with each other. In 2017, it is estimated that 700 bears were living in Yellowstone region and only uh, 150 bears were living in the Yellowstone Park. So 700 bears were living in like all of the Yellowstone region, which is like includes like the long span, but the Yellowstone National Park is like a specific area and only 150 were living there. Um, but throughout the years, uh, there has been a fought to keep the bears on the threatened list. However, multiple times they have been taken off to eventually just be put back on the list. Um, so regardless of the ruling on these bears, whether they are considered threatened or not threatened, um, hunting in Yellowstone is prohibited, so you're not allowed to hunt anything. Um, you are allowed to hunt something and then, not in Yellowstone, but you're allowed to hunt and then carry it through Yellowstone as long as you have your permits. Um, so the population for elk in Yellowstone are more than 30,000 as of right now, which makes it the largest population of mammal in the park. Many elk populations number have dropped due to the wolves eventually being reintroduced and natural effects. It is also said that they tend to migrate, so it's hard to really get a count on them. So there could be more, or there could be uh, less, we don't really know. Um, some mammals that have been sighted in Yellowstone but are rarely ever, like, truly seen are the lynx, your mountain lions, uh, your wolverines, that kind of stuff. Many of these animals are, like, rarely ever seen, but they're, like, they're known to be in the area. Uh, now we're gonna get into my favorite part. Oh my god. I'm so excited to talk about this. So, fish. Uh, I love fishing. Um, I'm a catch and release person. I've only caught fish one time to eat the fish. Uh, but I am very much a catch and release type of person. Uh, but there are 18 species of fish in Yellowstone, and the most sought after fish is the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Um, however, these fish have experienced several threats from invasive species, killing them along with a disease called whirling disease. Um, all these fish are subject to catch and release regulations, so you can catch them, but you have to release them. Yellowstone's reptiles consist of the painted turtle, the rubber boa, prairie rattlesnake, bull snake, sagebrush lizard, lizard, valley garter snake, wandering garter snake, some amphibians are the boral coarse frog, tiger salamander, western toad, and columbia spotted frog. For your, like, uh, birds, there are 31, wait, no, 311, I missed one. <laughs> There's 311 species which have been reported to be in the park, but only half of them, uh, but only half of them nest there. So, uh, all these species have been reported, but, like, half of those species that I just said, like, 311, cut that in half, only those ones actually, like, nest in the park. Um, multiple bald eagles have been seen nesting in the park, along with extremely rare sightings of whooping cranes. Some other species are the common loon, your harlequin duck, osprey peregrine falcon and the trumpeter swan um since yellowstone experiences a, like a lot of fires many of like the trees uh we're getting into this but yeah many of the trees have adapted to not be killed of that which is very fucking cool to think 
Um, but a lot of these trees have grown to not be killed by fire. Some of these changes that the trees take on is like a thicker bark so that the fire doesn't affect them too much. Uh, seeds that can only be dispersed when the heat from the fire melts, like the resin that holds the seeds. So like these seeds will be in like resin, the fire will come along, will burn this resin away, and the seeds will fall. And then, you know, they'll technically plant themselves and all that kind of stuff. Uh, aspen trees can survive if, if the tree above has been burned. Uh, the roots, which are insulated in the ground, um, are kept safe, which can then just sprout new trees. Um, the National Park Service states that in a natural state, the grasslands tend to burn uh, an average of every 20 to 25 years, while the forests only burn every 300 years. 35 fires are ignited by lightning every year, and 6 to 10 are started by people, mainly on accident. Uh, there are three lookout towers that are staffed by trained firefighters in the area. Mount Washburn's tower is open to the public and has an observation tower. Uh, very few fires burn them more than 100 acres. When we talk about that forest fire in 1988, it is very rare a fire ever gets out of that, like, that big out of control. It is most likely an accident that it has. Most of them only burn 100 acre uh, acres and then a very big majority rarely reaches over even an acre before they burn themselves out. Um, the current policy for the park to watch fires uh, and stop ones that are in actively dangerous places or to watch them and let them burn themselves out because in uh, actual truth some fires are good for the environment. Uh, some rangers will start what is called a prescribed fire uh, that is deliberately starting a fire uh, that is allowed to burn to a certain extent. There are also some controlled burns. As of right now, the fire management plan is to let natural, natural fires burn unless it threatens lives or property. So a fire, if a fire starts out randomly in the wild, the order is to let that fire burn until it threatens a life or threatens someone's property. When it starts to do that, then they step in. But until then, we normally just let those fires burn themselves out because fires are actually really good for the environment. Uh, it, they're really good. Um, but yeah, so I would like to cover the fire of 1988 in a later date. As of right now, all you have to know is that it was the biggest fire and almost burned most of the park. And almost 793,000 acres were burned. So now we get into my favorite part, which is your recreation. This is going to be, oh, I love these. This is like all the stuff you can do in the park. So since the mid-1960s, uh, mid at least 2 million tourists have visited Yellowstone almost every single year. July is the busiest month for the park, and at the peak of the summer months, there are over 3,700 employees for the park. 800 employees work either permanently or seasonally for the National Park Service. Um, due to long-term road reconstruction efforts, Many roads are closed during the summer months due to, like, short repair seasons. So, considering Yellowstone is up in Wyoming and Montana and Idaho, they get really bad winters. So, think of it like this. Like, if you live somewhere down south, you probably have to, like, live with construction, like, all year round. Because your winters aren't really too bad. They can get very cold and sometimes ice over. But you're not getting heavy amounts of snow. Up north, you're getting a fuck ton of snow. Uh, and up in parks... The, definitely more dangerous roads you got like by your mountainsides so they have very very short repair seasons they have basically late spring very late spring and all of summer and that's about it to repair whatever they need to repair so a lot of the times your roads are closed during summer uh, although the park has 310 miles of paved roads which can be accessed from like five different entrances there's no public transportation in the park but many Tour guide companies offer motorized transport or guided snowmobile and snow coaches tours in the winter. So, um, basically what they're saying is, like, you're not going to find a tram system in uh, your park. You're mainly going to have to either bring your car or go through a tour guide. Places like Old Faithful, Canyon, and Mammoth Hot Springs are very busy during the summer months, and traffic jams caused by road construction or by people stop to observe wildlife, which I'm going to say right here, stop doing that stop okay i understand if you're on a road and um let's say a bear walks out right if they're in your way stop right like if you can't go past them stop 
But the second they leave, the second they go off into the corner and they're off in like the grass and stuff and they're not bothering you, fucking go, okay? Because what's going to happen is what a lot of people do is they'll get out of their fucking cars and they'll watch this bear. And sometimes it'll fucking, like, it's almost like stalking the bear. And it's like, stop, you're scaring this poor animal. You're scaring an animal that doesn't know what's going on. What you're also doing is causing a lot of, like, traffic backup, which shouldn't be happening because what you should be doing is staying in your fucking car and going when the animal leaves. Don't chase the animal. Don't approach the animal. Don't do anything to the animal. Take your far away, you know, like, photos and leave. Stop getting close to the animal, because what happens is you're going to get close to the animal, the animal's going to get agitated because all these fucking people are around it, and they're going to get angry, and then you're going to get attacked, and then you're going to be like, why did it do that? And the animal's going to get killed because it attacked a human. So yeah, just stop. Stay in your cars, take photos from your cars, and then go. I hate when they, I hate when people stop and get out of their cars, because you're just scaring the animal more. So, go. But anyways... Um, the, these, uh, road constructions and people stopping for wildlife can result in very long delays to these famous areas. Uh, the National Park Service maintains nine visitor centers and museums and is responsible for the maintenance of historical structures and many of the other 2,000 buildings, uh, in the park. Campfire programs, guided walks, and other interpretive presentations are available at numerous locations in the summer. Camping is available in the park at nearly 2,000 locations. There are backcountry campsites which are available, but they can only be accessed by foot or by horseback, uh, and most require permits to even go to. Uh, mountaineering in the park is discouraged due to the volcanic rock and its instability. Um, dogs are allowed in the park, but only on leash and in very spe specific locations. Around most thermal structures, there are wooden paths, which are very important to stay on. If you don't know, so I'm going to get into this again, about the wooden paths around your geothermal areas. Stay on those wooden paths. It is for your safety. They're not there to, like, take away from, you know, what, uh, like, oh, there's a really beautiful looking geyser over there. They're keeping us off this path so that we can't go see that. Let's go see that. No. What they are doing is those wooden paths that are on the floors... They are there because they know that you will not fall through the floor. And what I'm talking about is, if you didn't know, <laughs> uh, if you didn't know, the land around a geyser, very, very uh, soft. And so what can happen, and what has happened before, is people will step off of these wooden paths and they'll walk close to a geyser, they'll walk through this area, and what has sometimes happened is the land is so soft that people have fallen through into scalding hot water and there's nothing anybody could do. Nothing. So, stand on the wooden path. It is there for you. It is there for your protection. And, yeah, just stay on the wooden path. I'd rather you still be here than in the bottom of a geyser. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so... Uh, hunting is prohibited in Yellowstone, and other national forests surrounding the area allow it uh, during open season. So the difference is, like, a national forest is, like, a small forest that is, like, you know, protected. Uh, like a national park is, like, a place that is off-limits. It's like a park, you know. You can't go hunting in a park. <laughs> uh, fishing uh, is very popular, but you do need a license, and most of the fish are a catch and release. Uh, boating is prohibited on most rivers and creeks except for a very small five-mile stretch on the Lewis River, and I believe it was stated that, like, it's uh, only boats that are not electronic, like, rowboats. Get out there and start rowing if you want to really go boating. That rhymed. Oh my god, I didn't mean to do that. Um, another thing, don't feed the wildlife. Just yet again. That's another thing I put here. Don't feed the wildlife. Stop feeding the wildlife. Keep your food to yourself. They'll find, they'll find some on their own. <laughs> Stop feeding the wildlife. Uh, this is our last thing we're going to cover. And I literally just labeled it that one strip of land. If you don't know, uh, there is a strip of land in Idaho that it, a lot of people consider you can do any crime there and you won't be charged. 
So, in a small strip of Idaho, it is believed that it may be impossible to impanel a jury in compliance with the vicinage clause of the Sixth Amendment for a crime committed in the small, unpopulated portion of Idaho. One defendant tried to bring it up, but eventually pleaded guilty with the plea deal, which included that he not bring up the strip in his argument. So basically what it states is like, um, what they wanted to say was that you cannot have a jury of your peers there considering nobody lives there. That's kind of what they're pulling. It's like, you can't have, I can't have a jury of my peers if I'm the only one in this area. It's, it's a very weird way to think and you really have to be a lawyer to kind of understand it and stuff like that. And like, that's as much as I understand about it. Um, but it is kind of like, I, a lot of people talk about it and it's very scary and it's like, you know, all people can commit murder here, but it's like, I believe there's like certain crimes where even if you commit it in there, like a federal crime, if you commit a federal crime, you can still get charged because once you commit a federal crime, it's not a jury of your peers anymore. It's like the state, I believe against you or something like that. It's, it's a different thing, but there's, there's ways you can get charged in that strip of land. It is not 100% go commit any crime you want it is very very small crimes that you can kind of like get away with it's not anything major but that one has been talked about and that one has been you know interested in but other than that y'all guys have y'all survived you got through the history the biology the ecology the geography of yellowstone we are done uh but yeah so our next episode i don't have the park right away my mom's picking out the park (laughs) uh i promised her she could pick out the second park so once i get that one we'll start the research um i'll post it on the community tab if y'all are interested and that's about it thank you guys so much for um like listening to this i know it's like a lot um and you know it's it's just a lot so yeah (laughs) um i do hope you guys really did enjoy this the research is really fun i enjoy it so much um but yeah i i'm so excited to start this podcast i love national parks and i hope you guys do too uh if you really do like this uh please like and subscribe it keeps me going uh and yeah so thank you for joining me in through the parks so until our next adventure may your trails be filled with wonderlust and i will catch you in the parks all right goodbye